Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nirav Shah, the Director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Governor Janet Mills, Commissioner Heather Johnson from Maine's Department of Economic and Community Development, and Commissioner Jean Lambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. We're pleased to be able to join everyone this afternoon to provide an update on where we stand with respect to COVID-19 for today, Friday, December 11th, 2020. I'll, pro I'll provide an update first with where we stand with respect to the epidemiology of COVID-19 and some recent developments on the vaccine front, and then turn things over to Governor Mills before we turn to questions. And I begin my update today on yet another unfortunate and sad note. The Maine CDC has received the reports of an additional four Maine people who have died with COVID-19. One of whom was a man in his 80s from Hancock County. Another was a woman also in her 80s from Hancock County. The third was a woman also in her 80s from Oxford County. And finally, a woman in her 70s from Penobscot County. I'd like to take a moment to extend our deepest condolences to the friends, family members, and communities of all four of these individuals. Collectively, their passings mark now 250 deaths among Maine people with COVID-19. As of right now, there are a total of 15,206 cases of COVID-19 statewide, an increase of 345 since yesterday. Of those, 13,332 are confirmed cases, an increase of 299, and 1,874 are probable cases, an increase of 46. As I mentioned a moment ago, sadly, 250 Maine people have died with COVID-19, and cumulatively, 855 individuals have been hospitalized. Right now, across the state, 182 people are in the hospital with COVID-19, 50 of whom are in an intensive care unit and 16 of whom are on a ventilator. Among our cases, 1,882 are healthcare leaders. Turning next to a few outbreak updates. Just today, Maine CDC has opened epidemiological investigations into the following outbreak situation. One at the McMahon Elementary School in Lewiston, where we are aware of four cases. Another at the Otterbrook Child Care in Fairfield, where we are aware of four cases as well. A third at Presque Isle High School with five cases. Another at the Sacopee Valley Elementary School, where three cases are known. At Security System Services, where we are aware of three cases. At the Toddle Inn in Gorham, three cases. And yesterday, Maine CDC opened epidemiological investigations into the following outbreaks. At the Enclave School, at the Enclave of Scarborough, where we are aware of four cases. At the Gardner Area High School, uh, where we are also aware of four cases. At Zippel Elementary School in Presque Isle, 10 cases. At the Inn at Village Square in Gorham, 16 cases. At Noble Middle School in Berwick, four cases. At Seaside Rehab and Healthcare in Portland, three cases. At the Toddle Inn in Scarborough, six cases. And finally, at Whitney Energy in Lincoln, where we are aware of four cases. Among all of the cases reported to Maine CDC in the past 24 hours, 34% were from York County and about 23% were from Cumberland County. I'd like to take a second to mark a few milestones that Maine CDC has accomplished with respect to our response. First, as of this morning, more than 1 million COVID-19 test results have been reported to Maine CDC. That means our disease detectives have reviewed more than 1 million lab results. As challenging as that is, as challenging as it has been, and as challenging as it will be, the team at Maine CDC has continued 
to make sure that we are able to review those results and stay on top of where things stand. At our testing laboratory here in Augusta, the main CDC's laboratory, we've also performed now over 200,000 tests for COVID-19 alone, just since the beginning of our activation. And finally, our public health emergency preparedness program with respect to PPE has filled now close to 4,000 orders for PPE across the state, totaling almost 3.3 million pieces of PPE statewide. I'd like to next turn <clears throat> to a quick announcement with respect to quarantine. Not long ago, Maine CDC announced that we were lowering the quarantine period for individuals who had been exposed to COVID-19 from 14 days to 10 days. That was consistent with and pursuant to a scientific guidance document from the US CDC. I'd also like to note that we have similarly reduced the quarantine time for those who are entering Maine from states other than New Hampshire or Vermont to match that same reduction elsewhere. That is to say from 14 days to 10 days. This matches the newly adopted Maine CDC guidelines for quarantine. Now, I'd, I'd like to just draw a distinction. While the length of time for these different types of quarantine, that is to say for those who are close contacts of confirmed cases as, as compared to those who are traveling into Maine, the lengths of time for both of those quarantine periods are the same, 10 days. But there are and remain differences in the nature of that quarantine between travel versus close contact. That is to say, you can test out of the travel quarantine by virtue of having a recent negative test result. But if you are a close contact of somebody who has been confirmed to have COVID-19, you must stay in quarantine for the full 10 days, whether or not you are negative at any time. And finally, before I turn things over to Governor Mills, a brief update on where we stand with respect to vaccinations. Today, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services and Maine CDC have placed our second order for week number two of va for vaccines related to COVID-19. As many may have heard, yesterday, an expert independent advisory committee of the, of the United States FDA voted to recommend to the commissioner of the US FDA the issuance of an emergency use authorization. The commissioner of the US FDA expects that document to be signed sometime in the next coming days, which opens the door for vaccine to start flowing into Maine. Last week, we entered our first of such orders and made that order with the Operation Warp Speed and the US CDC. This week, we entered our second such order. I'll go through the numbers in one moment. But one note, we use the word order, but really it's more of providing the federal government the names and addresses of the facilities that we would like the vaccine shipped to. The amounts that we are allocated are given to us. It's much more about telling our colleagues at Operation Warp Speed where to send the doses of vaccine to. Just a few quick numbers. All of this is also found on our website in a and in a press release, but just a few short numbers. Last week, we submitted an order for 12,600 individual, 12,675 individual doses of the Pfizer vaccine. That's enough for the first dose for 12,675 individuals. This week, week number two, we have submitted an order for 37,850 doses, 13,650 of which are of the Pfizer vaccine and 24,200 of which are from a, for the Moderna vaccine, which itself will be analyzed by the US FDA's advisory committee this upcoming week. In a recently issued press release, as well as on our website, we provide further details on the breakdown of where those doses will be shipped. Governor Mills, I'd like to turn things over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Shah. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, appear uh, from my office in the Maine State House. I share 
uh, the great pleasure of all Americans in the development and approval of the vaccine uh, just yesterday uh, and the uh, allocation of vaccines to Maine, whatever quantities we can get, whenever we can get them. Uh, and thank you and Commissioner Lambrew for your um, tireless efforts at um, working with so many sectors of our communities to figure out where those can go, how they can get out to the broadest number of people as fast as possible. My uh, quarantine, as you know, ended on Tuesday of this week. Thank you very much. My, I will say masks do work. I'm living proof. Although I didn't have any symptoms and I tested negative, um, I was quarantined because I was exposed to the virus by a member of the security detail uh, just before that person developed symptoms and tested positive. Look, uh, if that person had not been wearing a mask and we were both wearing a mask while I was in the vehicle, before that person developed symptoms, I firmly believe I would have contracted the virus. We know that face, face coverings can stop the spread of the virus and we need people to wear them, simple as that. So because of the widespread community transmission uh, and the increased number of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in Maine today, I'm signing an executive order that I believe will strengthen and simplify compliance with the statewide fat face covering requirement. In Maine, for the last two months now, all people in a public setting have been required to wear a face covering. Starting today, the owners and operators of all indoor spaces, those in charge of events and happenings and gatherings, regardless of the type or size of the facility, they may not allow people who refuse to wear face masks to enter or remain in that place. And additionally, additionally, people who claim a medical exemption as a result of a disability, who say they can't wear a mask, they may be provided a reasonable accommodation, such as curbside pickup, but they may not, they may not be allowed to enter or remain in the facility without a mask. Prior to this, retail, associate, re retail stores with more than 50,000 square foot of uh, shopping space, along with certain establishments like bars, restaurants, tasting rooms, social clubs, lodging operations, they all re were required to require hit customers to wear face coverings and they could deny entry. Now they must deny entry and smaller entities as well must deny entry, deny service, deny per a person the right to remain in this facility. I said before, you know, I didn't want a, a teenage clerk of a small mom and pop store to be forced to play COVID cop to someone who's refusing to wear a mask and being belligerent. I still don't want to do that. We've always respected and sought voluntary compliance. So in addition to the day, today's executive order, we're dedicating 100,000 in remaining federal CARES Act funds to continue our Keep It Maine public awareness campaign by DHHS to emphasize the importance of these basic health and safety precautions, wearing a face covering, staying six feet apart, washing your hands. The department will also recruit holiday ambassadors, much like this summer's, this past summer's beach ambassadors, who will provide information in mass shopping areas in Portland and other um, cities uh, throughout the holiday season. I wanna be clear, while we'll do everything we can to educate and encourage people to voluntarily comply and wear face coverings to protect their health and safety and that of others. We have been communicating with law enforcement agencies as well, and they stand ready to assist if there's any trouble enforcing this face covering requirement. Everybody knows about the mask mandate, especially now that for the last month, facilities have had to post the requirement publicly. Anyone who still insists on entering a store or other facility without wearing a mask or insists on taking it off after getting inside, they can be and should be removed and charged with criminal trespass. Look, right now, more people are getting sick. More people are going to the hospital. More people are dying in Maine with COVID-19. In just the last month, from November 11th to today, 7,004 people tested positive for COVID-19 in Maine. 310 people were hospitalized. 92 people have died. I know we share the enthusiasm about a vaccine, but as Dr. Shah has said several times, this is no time to let down our guard. This is the time to keep our guard up and make sure that the vaccine will be able to work in the coming months. But we have to keep ourselves protected. Short of closing businesses, closing schools and requiring people to stay home, which is the last thing I wanna do, especially during the holidays, 
We are running out of available public health tools to reduce the, co the spread of COVID-19. If today's targeted steps don't work, more severe restrictions might be necessary, including reducing gathering limits as other states have done, or even business closures as some have done. Those options are a last resort. They're a last resort because they have such a devastating effect on people, their income and making them feel isolated. Think about it like this, if a school closes and a child has to be home all the time and what if that child's parent is a nurse or a doctor and can't find childcare? Then they have to stay home and we're short another nurse or doctor in our hospitals when we can last afford it. Importantly, Maine has committed our entire allotment of federal CARES Act funds now. Without additional funds from Congress, our workers and our businesses would be hit even harder than they were last spring if we were forced to take so, so, so many restrictions, take so many additional measures to save lives in the coming weeks and months. Please, to keep our businesses open this winter, keep schools open, sports alive again, wear your face covering when you're in public places. If you, have to, if you have to ask whether or not you should wear one, of course the answer is yes. Even if you don't agree with the policy and the law requirements and the advice of professionals from Dr. Shah, Dr. Fauci, and so many, many others, why would you take chances? Why risk the health of yourself, your family, and others, and healthcare workers too? 1,882, 1, I believe Dr. Shah said, 1,882 healthcare workers have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Think about that when you decide when you leave the house, whether you're gonna wear a mask or not. Please do it for them. Please don't make store employees jobs harder than they already are, especially this holiday season. Those people have been serving Maine on the front lines of this pandemic since the beginning. Look, those who are listening, are you headed to the mall right now? Are you going to the grocery store? Are you wearing a mask? If not, why not? If you're home from school, do you feel like you just gotta get out of the house and hang out with friends at their houses or at the local restaurant or bar or coffee shop? If you're alone, do you feel driven to go see your best friend? Go to your son or daughter's house or your neighbors, share a hug or a cup of coffee or a beer. Please think twice. Think twice because COVID is not taking the holiday off. It is there at the coffee shop. It is at your favorite diner. It's in the booth of your favorite restaurant. It's at your neighbors. It's in the car. It's in the store next to you on the sidewalk, in the next pew, at church. It's in the seat behind you on the bus. It is everywhere. How would you feel if your mother got sick? and had to go to the hospital, or you get sick, but there's no one there to take care of you because the intensive care unit's full, the ER is understaffed, and the nurse on duty is exhausted after working a double shift to take care of COVID patients. We need to commit to a different kind of holiday season this year, often a quiet one, perhaps a lonely one, but a healthy one, a safe one, it means not having friends over for a holiday dinner. It means not caroling, not going to a crowded party or service because COVID will be there. It is everywhere. I know things are hard right now. I know what I'm asking of everybody, it's hard, but even in these dark nights, there is still light and there will be light as the weeks and months come. Many of us are celebrating or about to celebrate some remarkable holidays. We're yearning to share food and drink and stories and give and receive hugs and give and receive gifts. Last night, Jewish families in Maine and elsewhere lit the first candle in the menorah in celebration of the first night of Hanukkah, a symbol of light and resilience. We can share in that this year. And during this challenging year, in the dark of a Maine winter and in the middle of a devastating pandemic, the lighting of each candle in the menorah provides more light in the world even symbolically. And it provides the hope and anticipation that tomorrow will be warmer and it will be brighter than today. While our celebrations may look different this holiday season, smaller, virtual, even telephonic, long distance, these holidays remain as meaningful and spiritual as they did through other darker times, through wars, depressions, storms, and hardships. But truly, this year, the best gift we can give and the best gift we can receive is health. 
And now, as in times past, we will keep the faith in our communities and in ourselves alive. We are Americans. We are main strong, and we will get through this together. Thank you, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Governor Mills. Uh, again, Commissioner Johnson and Commissioner Wambrew uh, are also joining us as well. And we'll turn to our colleagues in the media. And the first question of the afternoon goes to Charlie from the BDN. Yep. Hi, uh, Governor Mills and Dr. Shaw and Commissioners Wambrew and Johnson. Um, I think probably my questions maybe are for Dr. Shaw. Uh, it's about the uh, first allocation of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, I, I, my question has changed slightly just with the new announcement about the second order of vaccines. But um, so I guess it had seemed last week that uh, there were a couple hospitals with super cold freezers that were each getting 975 doses delivered to them. Um, and then this new announcement has slightly different numbers. It looks like some of those, some hospitals are still getting 975, but it has different numbers for some other hospitals. And uh, it, I guess my question is just, can you um, clarify, maybe I'm just misreading it or, or did that plan change somehow? Um, so uh, Charlie, first of all, the number that Maine will be receiving has not changed. Uh, that remains static. What we've done in this latest version is because of the conversations that we have had with the chief medical officers of those institutions uh, over the past couple of days, we've been able to refine it a little bit more uh, and recognize that, for example, some hospitals may have gotten initially an allocation of 975, which, for example, may have been more than the entire staff at the hospital. In, concert, in consultation and in discussion with chief medical officers across the state, uh, what we've realized is that there were some hospitals, again, that could use a little bit extra in week one. So what we've done in the latest version of the spreadsheet is, is refine that a bit further. So that's all. It's the same raw number of doses with more granularity about where they would be going. And I'll okay. add to that question yeah. that we, we really do strive to figure out how we think about this holistically. We appreciate that the need is great and the allocation that we're getting in the first week is relatively small. So we are prioritizing those hospitals where they've had a significant proportion of inpatients with COVID-19 to ensure that they have the staff should the surge in hospitalizations continue. But week two allows us to broaden that. We expect to be able to get to all hospitals that have registered with the US CDC some vaccine in week two. We also will be working with EMS in week two, as well as beginning to get to home health and hospice workers who are on the front lines helping to keep people out of hospitals. We do ask people for patients. It's going to be a challenge for us to be able to get enough vaccines for people in Maine, but we are going to work through this process as equitably, efficiently, efficiently and quickly as possible. Okay, uh, and then just a, a sort of a quick follow up the um, the state's vaccine <clears throat> distribution plan had a, a, a an assessment, I think, of how many high risk for exposure frontline medical workers are at each hospital. Do you know will will um, hospitals as they get the doses kind of be starting with that first group, and then do you know what priority they'll be giving kind of past that for different types of workers? Sure. Uh, what we've recommended is in keeping with the US CDC's guidelines that hospitals focused on the highest risk employees, staff members within their institutions. Those are broadly speaking defined as any individual paid or unpaid who either provides direct patient care or could be coming in contact with infectious material. Even within that categorization, the data suggests that there are some healthcare workers that are even then at a higher risk. We've recommended to the hospitals that they proceed along that prioritization plan for the staff members within their facilities, such that those who are at the highest risk of coming into contact with a patient with COVID-19 or with infectious material that could harbor COVID-19, that they be the ones who be prioritized for vaccination in the earliest weeks. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna, Turn things over to Patty White next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. 
Um, the first shipments of the vaccine, is the plan to use those the doses strictly as the, the first dose for people so that, and then, okay, can you just explain that a little bit more? Sure, uh, Patty, what we, have, what we have been told and briefed by Operation Warp Speed is that when doses are allocated, for example, the 12,675 from last week or the 37,850 for week two, that those represent the first doses that would be needed as part of the two dose series. Operation Warp Speed and the US CDC have additionally told us that they will on their end keep or hold back the second doses and send those to us at the appropriate week when they would be needed for administration. That's what's been told to us thus, thus far and we are building our planning assumptions around that. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got a question about nursing homes. A national CVS spokesperson told me that they've been told by the US CDC that they can't start administering the vaccines until December 21st. Is, is there a, a similar time frame for Maine? Generally speaking, th that is right. I don't know that I would uh, put it as stridently as, as they did. Here, here is the breakdown, Patty. We, um, we, we, it has been told to us by the US CDC, which is really the organization that is engineering that partnership, that there would be a two week preparation period between the times, between when states activated that partnership and between when the first clinics, the first vaccination sessions would occur on site. And during that two week period, the, uh, the pharmacies would be working with the long-term care facilities skilled nursing facilities to do things like get uh, obtain in, uh, informed consent, provide information about the vaccine itself, just go through the scheduling process of when the clinics would be, getting folks' names, all of that back-end administrative work, they would spend that time doing. That time is expected to take roughly two weeks. And so thus we were looking at the first weeks of those clinics starting approximately December 21st, I don't know that we've received final or official confirmation of exactly when they would, but we're anticipating them starting as soon as December 21st, again, to allow enough time for those things like informed consent, education to family members, all of those things to happen first. Great, do you happen to have a ballpark for about how many nursing homes are participating in the CVS Walgreens agreement? I do, uh, it is 680 skilled nursing and other residential facilities across Maine. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn over to Kevin Miller at the Press Herald. Great, thank you so much. Um, first question is for uh, Governor Mills. So regarding your new executive order, um, you know, we've all seen the inconsistency when we're out there in the stores with people not wearing masks and you know, some, sometimes the, the, oftentimes the store is not, choosing to not enforce that. So I guess my question is, if someone goes into a store and sees this, what's their next step? You know, where do they take this? Who, who do they call to report it? Do they call the police? You know, I guess what, what's the next step when someone sees a problem and they see that it's not being enforced? Thanks, Kevin. I mean, the first step I'd recommend is talking to the manager of that particular facility, that store. First of all, I would leave a store if there were people in there without masks. I wouldn't want to expose myself uh, to that uh, possible spread of the virus. Secondly, call the manager. Thirdly, Call the local police and uh, try to use friendly persuasion. But if it, if that doesn't if that fails, then call the police. Um, you know we have tools in the toolbox, an extensive number of tools in the toolbox, and we're ready to use them between now and when the when the vaccine finally takes place. And and a, a follow up uh, question: Was this um, the decision to go with this? Is this strictly because of the increasing case numbers, or were there specific events that that triggered it? Like for instance, we saw down in Phippsburg, the selectmen down there have said that that they're not going to require their town require people to have masks when they're coming into their town office, despite the existing executive order. Um, so was this in response to anything in particular, or just the rise in case numbers? Well, you know, if I were if I were uh, running a facility, any kind of facility, it's a town office or a business or a private business, um, I would not want to take the risk. First of all, my insurance company wouldn't want me taking that risk either. There's extensive liability involved potentially if someone is exposed in your facility and you've deliberately ignored the public health and safety precautions. Um, you're asking what can be done. I guess I, I wasn't aware, but uh, the particular. Um, 
announcement that you that you, you referred to. I'm happy. We're happy to reach out to those people and talk to them about what the rules are and why they're there and how they should enforce them. Kim, if I could just add as well, Governor Mills and I have spent some time in the last few days working with retailers, the Retail Association of Maine, Dana Connors and the Chamber of Commerce, really trying to look at effective solutions to protect employees, to protect consumers and to keep business capacity as high as possible. And so I think this is a really good step for that. And, and lastly, uh, and, and back to the governor or, or to either of you, you said that police stand ready to step in. You know, we've seen in other states that, that police have decided they are not going to enforce this um, in, in some some places. Um, are you confident that police are going to be ready or are going to be willing to come in and enforce it and to remove someone if they're trespassing? I am. Look, they all took an oath when they took office, when they put on that badge as well. When they went through their training at the academy, which I participated in, they understand that they are required to enforce the law. In this case, one of the most obvious laws is the law about criminal trespass. If somebody enters or remains into a, in a facility, a uh, private place without permission or with violating rules. And that's why we had posted, we had required the posting of a notice to give people fair warning when they try to enter a place without a face mask, they are basically committing tra criminal trespass in addition to violating the executive order. So though they're used to enforcing those laws, they will enforce these laws continue still. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm gonna turn good, over good to, to Amy you, uh, in your office, uh, Governor. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to turn it over to Amy Brown next. Thank you. Continuing on that track, how are businesses being notified about this change? Do you have some system for communicating with businesses? I think I heard you say, how oh, are sorry. businesses being? Yes. Yeah, do you have a system by which the businesses are formally notified of this change or will they just hear about it through the media? And, and did you say when it goes into effect, is it immediately? It goes into effect, yes, thank you. It goes into effect now. Okay. Now, because there have been questions asked. Questions we've gotten, for instance, are, well, what if somebody comes to the door and says, I don't have to wear a mask because I have a disability, whatever that might possibly be. And so questions have been asked, well, what can I do? Will I get sued for discrimination under the ADA if I don't let somebody in without a mask? Well, the greater problem is, what about that person exposing other customers, other people, other employees, uh, store managers and whatnot? That's the greater priority regardless of the merits of somebody saying they have a disability or can't have a medical exception. So we are saying very clearly, there's no medical exception that applies or that allows you to insist on coming into a facility, a store and the like without a mask or insist on remaining in a store or facility uh, without a mask. It's a clear bright line now. So um, that's one of the things we do. How, how we communicate this? Well, we had about an hour long um, a Zoom conference with a number of uh, major businesses and, and retailers across the state just the other day. Um, and they expressed their issues. I expressed my issues and I told them what I thought the options were. And uh, they, at the end of that, they appeared to be all on board with more vigorous messaging, more vigorous compliance and enforcement. Some of the, some of the bigger operations clearly are able to hire security guards to help enforce as well. And they're, they're, um, uh, interested in doing that or they're doing that I guess so uh, we've been talking to a lot of people and Commissioner Johnson talks to them more frequently than I do and answers questions and uh, and talks with their uh, CEOs and their managed store managers uh, and and uh, advocates and lobbyists frequently so the local mom pa convenience store will find out through hearing about it through the media primarily or is some kind of is there another formal system for communicating with everyone so well, the, the, we have the a, media is the quickest way, isn't it? I think. Go ahead. Heather. It's sorry, Governor. Yeah. So we have a number of ways that we communicate with businesses across the state, including associations that these businesses are members of. Additionally, we use social media. We have a web presence. And for the people that we have had contact with for a variety of reasons, including that they've downloaded COVID prevention checklists, we push out emails to them so that they're as aware, aware as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Shah, I, I have a few questions from listeners. I'll just do one today. But uh, 
a listener is wondering about what you've said in the past about wanting to see that all of these vaccines are well independently peer reviewed before you would sign off on being okay with them. Is that part of the process before they're given the emergency use authorization? Are you satisfied that they are being well independently peer reviewed? Uh, that is part of the process. The FDA's Scientific Advisory Com uh, Committee uh, goes by uh, the name VERBAC, which is an acronym for something much longer. Uh, they met all day yesterday. They had an extensive marathon meeting to review every piece of the scientific data, as well as the safety data and the efficacy data surrounding the Pfizer va vaccine candidate. Uh, as we speak right now, a companion advisory committee to the US CDC is meeting right now to consider those same data to make clinical recommendations in whom those the, the vaccines are, are best suited for. Uh, both of those advisory committees are filled with experts who are independent and not affiliated either with the government agencies or with the companies themselves. So that is very much part of the process. And it's important to note, they do so in a transparent manner. FDA's committee meeting yesterday was broadcast for anyone to listen to and the US CDC's committee is equally broadcast and open to anyone to the public to listen in on their deliberations. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn over to Steve at WMTW. Doctor, thank you. Quick question about freezers. Uh, knowing that you needed so many freezers to store the uh, vaccine, did you put out a call to borrow freezers and if so, what was the response? Um, you know, Steve, I, I don't know that we we put it out as a, a call as, as such. I, I don't want to make it seem as if we shot up a signal into the air or something of that nature. We worked with partners with whom we typically work on logistics matters. Uh, uh, partners uh, such as colleges and universities, other entities across Maine, who had heard that these freezers would be something that states would need. And as we were chatting with them about our vaccine planning, we were also finding folks coming to us saying, you are free to utilize our freezer for X period of time. We had outreach from Southern Maine Community College, Colby College, uh, a number of others. And thanks to those wonderful partners, in addition to ordering two freezers ourselves for our warehouse, we've also been able to work with those partners to secure additional cold storage space uh, at our central warehouse. It's a, just a great example of community yeah, collaboration. It, it's a, I mean, I, I you know, uh, folks, when I, when, I, when I was moving to Maine, talked about the spirit of community. And, and for me, this was example 1,900 something of the ways in which when we all need to come together, it happens in Maine. And it, it definitely happened here. Uh, I'm gonna turn over to Sam Rogers at News Center next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Governor Mills, Commissioner Johnson, I'm sure this will, will go to you. Um, and I know you, you've been speaking with, you know, realty uh, groups and different types of businesses. And what's the advice? Because, you know, personally, I, I have seen in kind of bigger retail shops, you know, younger and teenage employees and, you know, trying to encounter um, and approach older gentlemen that aren't wearing masks to try to enforce it. And what's the the approach and the message that you are giving to these these stores and shops on how to deal with somebody who, uh, doesn't want to wear the mask and, and like you mentioned, you know, tries to say that they had health concerns or anything like that. Okay, we, we're putting it on the owner, manager, operator of that facility, that store, whatever it is. It is now their absolute responsibility to enforce the mask requirement. No, it shouldn't fall on a clerk who's working alone late at night, who's, you know, earning low wages to make a living, but it's got to fall on somebody and it's up to the management to figure that out. If they're big enough a facility, maybe they can hire security to be there to help out uh, for that and for a lot of reasons. And if it's a busy time of year, which it is, maybe they ought to be doing that. Uh, and um, they can have, they can have, they can reach out to the local law enforcement and make sure they come quickly when they're called, that kind of thing. But um, it's just too important for us to say, you're excused from this, you're waived, you're not um, required to do this because everybody is now, everybody is. Uh, our businesses know 
that the way to bring back the economy, the way to reinvigorate the state of Maine, the way for cruise ships to be reconnected to the state of Maine, docking again next summer, the way for the Canadian border to be open so that 17% 17 of our tourists can come back here and stay here and do business here, the way for us to again brand our beautiful state as a safe place to come, a safe place to shop, a safe place to live, work, play, and do business is for us right now, universally, together, enforce this mask mandate. Yeah, Governor, if I could as well, you know, I think, Sam, those stores all have individual processes, as the governor mentioned, really centered around kind of managers stepping in and being helpful. But certainly, you know, we are part, part of the reason to do this is to protect these employees as well, right? They are, if people are coming to the stores not wearing masks, that puts them at risk as well. So we're encouraging kind of everybody to work together and asking kind of consumers to do their part to help protect these employees as well. And I know you both have mentioned a few minutes ago about tools and, and additional solutions. If you don't mind kind of, you know, elaborating on what specifically those are. Uh, and I know Governor Mills, you had mentioned that these, this executive order is, you know, try to try to prevent uh, those more severe restrictions. And do you know, is, is there, you know, specific data that you're looking at to make that decision? Or is this going to be something you'll have to, you know, make, make a call in a few weeks or, or however long based on, on where we are as a state? Thanks, Sam. I'm watching, we're all watching things day by day, day by day. And we're also talking about the dangers of holiday gatherings, private or public. We, we issued these warnings before Thanksgiving. And I think many people were compliant, observant of the public health, health and safety uh, protocols, but many weren't. And we're seeing uptick now Statistically, it's an uptick within weeks of Thanksgiving. We don't want to see that hit even harder after the current holidays. And there are a lot of tools in the toolbox. You can look at what other states have done. I think Governor Cuomo today banned indoor dining. Other states have looked at their capacity limits and gone to lower numbers for indoor dining and indoor um, uh, attendance of things and outdoors as well. Other states have closed things right up uh, and technically that can be done. Um, other states have changed the, the indoor and outdoor gathering limits. Those are, I think, very extreme measures, but they are there as tools. Um, and we did that, some of that last spring uh, and people were pretty uh, compliant. But unlike last spring, if we were to do that now, right now, today, there would be no federal support to help keep those businesses alive, keep unemployment benefits uh, flowing to those who lose their jobs. I don't want to see people lose their jobs. We see unemployment benefits running out for 42,000 people just in a couple of weeks from now. I want the federal government to step up to the plate as well and help us do our job and help our people stay safe. I'm going to turn it over to Evan Pop next. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about the state's vaccine distribution plan. Um, so there are nine states in one territory that have incarcerated people in the first tier of vaccine prioritization. Um, and as I understand it, being currently incarcerated people in phase two, um, we've heard from some advocates who want incarcerated people to be moved up to phase 1B, um, which in Maine includes older people living in congregate settings. And so I'm wondering, considering the outbreaks that have happened in prisons and jails in Maine during the pandemic, is Maine CDC considering moving incarcerated people into phase 1B? So, Evan, I think I'll just begin to answer that we right now are focused on the three weeks ahead of us. The vaccines that we expect to get in these first three weeks don't even cover half of what is 1A, the healthcare workers and long-term care residents, which is what the US CDC advisory group recommends. So that is our focus right now. We certainly will be turning to 1B and C and phase two and three shortly thereafter, but everything's on the table. Thank Evan, you. I'll add only that I agreed with, with Commissioner Wambrew. I don't think any final decisions have been made. And we are really laser focused on getting vaccines, say to frontline health care providers, 
EMS clinicians, uh, long-term care facility residents. That all being said, we fully recognize the difficulty and the impact that COVID-19 can have on say the families who may have someone who is incarcerated. Uh, it's already a difficult time, but having knowing that a family member is in incarceration right now uh, with COVID-19 out there certainly adds a, a level of, of, of added concern, and we appreciate that. All of these things are under discussion right now, but we're also simultaneously really focused on making sure we get the vaccine to healthcare facilities, EMS clinicians as quickly as we can. And um, just as a, as a follow-up to that, um, I was wondering if you could shed some light on what the difference is in the timeline um, a vaccination for someone, for example, who's in, in phase 1B versus uh, phase 2. I read in, in the draft plan that phase 1 is expected to take about six weeks. Um, is that still kind of about the thinking? It really does depend on what the production of the vaccines is. That is probably the, the major governing variable for how quickly Maine and other states can move through the various phases. It really is a function of how much vaccine is being produced. Uh, we have been preparing for months now to make sure that there are as many vaccinators, people who can vaccinate as, uh, as, are, as are able to and as are available. Uh, so we believe our capacity to receive the vaccine, although we still need more to do, uh, is, is something that we can make sure we can get vaccine in. But the main variable that will govern how we move through those phases is how much vaccine we get. Great. Um, and Governor Mills, just um, a question for you. Um, I, th I think it's probably fair to say that 2020 has been a, a challenging year for a lot of people in Maine um, with the virus and, and a lot of other issues going on. Um, but I was wondering if anything comes to mind for you as a specific policy that was passed or put in place this year or something else in, in politics or public policy that you think um, maybe was a bright spot when it comes to 2020. I think I heard you ask about any bright spot in public policy during this past year. Because there have been a lot of bright spots, not just in public public policy, but in the way that folks with good hearts and good souls have stepped up to the plate and helped others. You know, Mr. Rogers said his mother said, when times are bad, look for those who helping who are helping other people. They're everywhere. And to see, you know, people at American Roots and L.L. Bean, IDEX, Flowfold, so many businesses and small groups across the state, across the state here, helping make PPE, helping get people back to work, making testing equipment at Abbott, IDEX, swabs at Puritan. The main community colleges have stepped up to the plate to train people in COVID, res COVID respectful hospitality jobs, things of that sort. It's not just one, one simple policy. Although I have to say, when the legislature left in March, they left us with good tools. They left us with expanded uh, flexibility with unemployment and things of that sort. Um, and there's a lot of goodwill out there. And I think we've seen that as much as anything else, despite the despair of some of these statistics and the daily death count, daily case count, the daily hospitalizations. There, is a, there has been shown as much goodwill as anything else in the state of Maine these last nine months. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick Whittle next. Thank you very much. And thank you for bearing with me while I was turning off the mute. A um, co couple of things. Um, I, I'm assuming we don't yet have a hard date on when the first healthcare workers in the state of Maine could be could be vaccinated? Is there even an as early as type date at this point? Patrick, I, I hesitate to provide one. Um, there, there's just, there's a, a lot of if this, then this, and if not this, then maybe this. So I, I, I just, nothing has been set in stone at the federal level yet, and thus it's difficult for us we have a, a, a range of when it might happen. And of course, we are ready to take the baton. We've been running for a while now and we're ready to have the baton passed to us so we can accelerate and sprint even further. But I, I don't want don't to prejudge the situation. There's just so many variables. Uh, we anticipate that it will be sometime next week. But beyond that, I, it, it's just really difficult to predict. 
I think, what Patrick, I think what Patrick is asking is, will there be a photo op as there was in the United <laughs> Kingdom? Will he yeah. be there to take photos of William I, Shakespeare? I might be getting at that. Yeah, it's <laughs> possible that I might be getting that, but I, I, I prefer an honest answer to a satisfying one. So. <laughs> and, well, and to just, you know, level set, while the advisory committee yesterday made the recommendation to, you know, for the vaccine to be approved, it has not yet been approved. So they think it's important. That is the key point where everything starts, but we're not quite there yet. Yep. Yeah. Good. Good. And then, um, and then to fill out the commissioner's thought, after that authorization happens, then the vaccine has to be shipped. Uh, it's got to be unpacked. It's got to be reconstituted. Uh, healthcare workers have to be ready to go. And so there, there are a number of steps, Patrick. And that's why, again, it's a lot of ifs, perhapses hopefully and then all of those things get coming together to vaccine actually occurring but we're looking at next week possibly that is what we are planning for okay well that's more, more of a window than we had a couple days ago mm -hmm. um also uh, there's there has been some some reporting that uh the federal government has uh earlier in the pandemic passed up on a chance to lock in more doses of the pfizer vaccine and that that could potentially delay the broader the broader rollout. So, has that moved the window at all? Or are we looking more at end of Q2, beginning of Q3 for a broad rollout, or do we not know that? So I'll start, um, Patrick. We we are still looking at that end of Q2, beginning of Q3, uh, and that is what we have been briefed out on by the U.S. CDC. Uh, I'm aware of the reports that you referenced. Um, I don't know to what extent those have altered or been a part of what the window is. I will tell you that the window that we've been given has been relatively within that time frame for some time now, but I simply just don't have enough information and can't speculate as to whether the reports that you referenced have altered that window in some way, but I'll let Commissioner Lambrou and the governor weigh in as well. So uh, the governor last week spoke with our congressional delegation who has written a letter asking for more visibility and transparency into the vaccine supply, because as we strive to prepare to vaccinate people in Maine, that type of information is essential for our plans. So we are hopeful that we get more answers to help us look out one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, one quarter, and that type of information is essential for our planning. Okay. I agree. I would agree. And I, I'm no defender of the current administration in Washington. But I mean, there were two issues. Why were the why were the estimated number of vaccine doses so much higher than what ended up being the case? And, and secondly, why did the federal government re, re, uh, decline Pfizer's offer of several months ago to order another, something like another 100 million on top of the current 100 million? And I think that offer was made at a time when people did not rightly know whether Pfizer would be approved, whether Moderna would be approved, AstraZeneca would be approved. So, I mean, I think there are reasons why that negotiation uh, did not succeed. So, uh, to, to, put a bow, to put a bow on this, at the moment we're, we're still looking at NQ2 beginning Q3 and it's still a moving target. Is that still a fair thing? And, 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 and just to be right? even, just to be even more, uh, uh, granular patrick for the for the thing that we're talking about that's sort of community level vaccination individuals who are say for example under the age of 65 who do not have serious medical conditions uh yes for for that for the for those folks um that we you know it is still a moving target as you say there's not been firm date set so much depends on production uh consistent with what earlier question but yes, that's the time frame, the window that we're hoping to be uh, starting to vaccinate folks in. And to put another bow on it, Patrick, that is exactly why Dr. Shaw has been saying repeatedly, it is why we have to keep our guard up, continue the precautions, take them even more seriously than before because of the rising numbers, because the vaccine really won't be effective if the virus is already prevalent in our communities. All right, thank you very much. And I'm gonna finally uh, turn to Brian Sullivan uh, for the final question of the afternoon. Relegated to the back, I must have made uh, Robert angry. I'll have to send him an email. Uh, I have a question about athletics, um, specifically the University of Maine. Uh, I know that the, the school has um, 
put in for an exemption to the 50 person indoor gathering limit. And I was just wondering as they've started their seasons on the road, uh, maybe for the governor or commissioner Lambrew, if uh, that was going to be granted, if they might be allowed to play a home game in an Alphonde arena, for instance, where it is um, larger and maybe an exemption might be granted. Uh, I'll just begin and say right now with our cases rising, our positivity rate rising, we have been looking hard at what our policies are, including our indoor gathering limit. I think that we're always concerned about changing those policies when we have this kind of spread. We do recognize that there are some settings that are big and spacious where there might be a way to accommodate public health, but I think at this time we have some concerns, but I don't know if Governor, Governor Mills, if you want to add anything to that. No, I share those concerns. Look, we didn't give an exemption to Oxford Plains Speedway last summer. We haven't given exemptions to people with large facilities of other sorts. Um, it's really tough to make exemptions on under stray from the general rule, especially when many states are reducing the indoor gathering limits, not expanding them, not granting more exemptions. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Dr. Shaw, I have a question uh, for you just about the uh, vaccine orders, and maybe you covered it in a uh, previous briefing, but how do you arrive at uh, the first order being 12,000 and the next being uh, 37,000? Is that um, just what they tell you you can have, or how do you arrive at, at that, that number? Yeah, you, you, you put your finger right on it. Again, you, you use that interesting word, arrive at. Uh, it's, uh, there, there is a, a centralized database uh, that, that states have and that we share in conjunction with Operation Warp Speed. It goes by the uh, intriguing name Tiberius. Uh, and uh, uh, it, is in, in, it is in this database called Tiberius where our allocations are given to us. And then we place orders, orders in quotes, against those allocations. And by which I mean order, we provide the names and addresses of the sites that we would like them sent to. Uh, certainly, if we had our druthers uh, we would not be ordering 12,600 and 25,000. There would be extra zeros on top of all of those things. But this is what this is what we are allocated. And our goal is to, within those allocations, make sure we're getting vaccine to the most vulnerable Mainers and the people who provide care for them. Thank you all. Uh, Governor, before I turn it over to you to close this out, I neglected this afternoon, everyone, to provide an update. I apologize for skipping over it. Uh, but to provide an update on our positivity rate. And so my apologies for that. Before I turn things back over to Governor Mills, however, our seven day positivity rate right now in Maine stands at 4.62% for PCR tests. Again, that's 4.62% for PCR tests. And our seven day testing volume in Maine stands at 634 PCR tests for every 100,000 people. My apologies for skipping over that. Governor Mills, I'd like to turn things over to you to close us out. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, and I just want to say that, um, first of all, our condolences also go out to those who haven't passed away due to COVID directly, but those who have encountered tremendous side effects and tremendous after effects of the environment surrounding the virus. And that includes the young man in Brunswick uh, who lost his life to suicide, about whom there's been a fair amount of publicity. We all want to open the schools. We all want to open up sports again. I raised five girls in the state. They love school sports and community sports. I love, I love community sports. And I love to have the schools open again and vibrant as places where communities can get together and share things and where kids can truly learn face to face with the teachers that we honor so much every day. But if we can get through these holiday, this holiday season, we can get through the next weeks and months till a, when a vaccine is is available to everyone and administered to everyone who is, is eligible, then we will get back to that point and our businesses will thrive again and we'll do everything we can to support them. And um, for all those who have kids at home, please hug them when you can. Make sure they know they're wanted and loved. They're feeling isolated too. They're feeling scared as well. The people I miss the most right now, not just my friends and my kids, but my grandkids. But 
recently I had a chance to Zoom with the two-year-old and four-year-old granddaughters. I call them grand girls, because they are. And they were making turkey pot pie with their mother. And I helped them make turkey pot pie over the Zoom, which is not easy, but at least you don't get your hands dirty. And it was so much fun, so much fun. It took a lot longer than usual, but when a four-year-old is cutting carrots with a butter knife, anything like that takes a long time. But we had as much fun. I couldn't give them hugs and kisses. I couldn't tuck them in at night, but I could be with them in every significant way except physically. And I intend to keep doing that. And I hope you do too with your friends and loved ones. So please stay safe this weekend and every week, every day. Stay healthy. Keep Maine strong. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining.